Good morning. Good morning. Can you just turn to your neighbor and say good morning and happy Easter? Can you do that? Good morning. Amen. Thank you for setting up the lights. <laughs> I want to make sure you can see me all the way to the back. It's a, a great privilege for me to be here, to be able to share the word with all of you. I know that the whole team, they're out of town. They're, they're having a, a very personal Easter. They're in Jerusalem. The, both are pastors and their family and, and some of your leaders too. It's amazing. Can you just look around and just thank God that uh, even if... Uh, Pastor Ben and Pastor Chris, they're not here. We're all here today, gathered to honor the Lord. Amen? Amen. 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 So why don't we all just give the Lord a hand of praise. <laughs> Apologize. I, like, like always, I always lose my voice. So by the time, you know, we're in the hour, my voice will come back. So we're, we're good for two hours today. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Can we all please stand if you don't mind? We're just going to come together and we're going to seek the Lord in prayer. And we're going to believe that God is going to do something amazing and great today. Amen? Amen. 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 Come on now. Amen. Amen. Uh, how many of you have heard me uh, preach? I know I've been here a couple of times. That's why I consider this such a great privilege. Easter. And i am uh, been given the task to share the word. So how many of you have heard me preach? Raise your hand. Okay, not bad. So for the rest, you haven't heard me preach yet. I really love for the congregation and the church to be part of the sharing. You know, I want to feed you energy and I want for you to give me energy as well. Amen. 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 Come on. When you say amen, you're saying, so be it, Lord. It's like saying, all right, all right, all right. Okay? Turn to your neighbor and say that. All right, all right, all right. Okay. So that's how we're going to be doing. Amen. Praise God. I'm here today with my family. My wife is here, Irene. Can you just wave to everyone, Irene? That's my wife. And my son, Kyle, and uh, Christian. Amen. And a uh, family friend, like an adopted daughter, to, uh, Richie is here. Thank you for having all of us. Can we, can we pray? Thank you, Jesus. Just lift your voice and give him praise. It's Resurrection Sunday. Come on, give praise to our living God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Father, we can never praise you enough. Specifically for this particular day as we look back in time. Knowing that this is the day where you broke the chains and the limitations that the human body has. Which is death. But yet you broke the loss of death. And you've destroyed the shackles of sin when you broke free and declared that you are alive indeed you are risen you are alive and that your spirit is in this place the veil was torn from the temple veil was torn from the top to the bottom signifying that the presence of God and the Spirit of God is made available Today, Lord God, we worship you for who you are. We worship you not for what you've done, but we worship you for who you are. And Father, I pray, bring the message into our hearts today, Lord God, so that from this day forward, every time we gather, we will always value the cross. The cross is full. Everybody say, the cross is full. Come on, help me out. The cross is full. It's, it's filled with all of our sins but the tomb is empty amen the tomb is empty because Christ is going to be held down with the loss of man and so today Lord God I pray let the same resurrection power be made available for everyone here today Lord God that we may trust the resurrection power that will bring restoration in our own homes and into our lives restoration into our physical bodies as well father anoint our, our hearts anoint your servant in jesus name amen amen give the lord a clap of praise i would like for us to read mark chapter 16 and uh, pastor pastor chris gave me this particular passage to preach on and uh, i said yes because uh, everybody knows the resurrection story. And it's amazing and it's also wonderful and great to be able for us to relive 
and reread the passage and and be excited once again to rediscover what the story is really all about. However, during the week, I was just like in deep prayer and, and I've preached like a thousand uh, Easter Sunday sermon. And I know you've heard a thousand Easter Sunday messages also. Amen. Yeah, amen. amen. And so like how, how, can be, how can we make this Easter message different? Now you have to understand that for a pastor like me, this Easter Sunday today is like our Super Bowl. This is the day that we are all excited for because traditionally a lot of people show up on an Easter that those that don't show up for any parts of the, the year, they just come because it's a time for family. It's a time for us to share meal. And so we bring friends over. By the way, who among you are here for the very first time? Like this is your first time to join this church. Raise your hand. Okay, no one? Okay, that's good. I'm in good company then and we're all friends. And, and, and so this is the day like every pastor is excited to preach. And we kind of like prepare hard and long for it. We kind of make sure, we want to make sure that the message is good. And I hope the message is going to be good today. Amen. 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 Come on now. Amen. Amen. Now if you give me a lot of love, this is going to go well. Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So Mark chapter 16, I don't know if you can read that, but I'm, I'm just going to read through it because Pastor Chris gave me this assignment. We just read it and then we'll go somewhere else, okay? I know the, the sons are here, so don't tell your dad. But then again, the narrative is, is always going to be the same. Yeah. We all know that there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Mark is believed to be the oldest of, of all the writers. It is the thinnest of all the Gospels. It, because Mark, the writer, just goes straight to Christ, not even going through a lot of the miracles and all. And, and so we're going to read the Mark account because it was also given to me as the passage to read. And I'm a good soldier. Jesus has risen. And in chapter 16, reading from verse 1, when the Sabbath, please read with me, it's over here, or whatever translation you have. You know, I usually, you, we usually, or we used to preach and say, turn to. Now I, we preach and say, turn on, because you have electronic devices. Turn on to, to Mark chapter 16. Verse 1, when Sabbath, read with me please. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Do not be alarmed, he said. You have to read with me. Do not be alarmed, he said. So the first message is, do not be alarmed. In some translations, in the Message Bible version, it says, do not be afraid. And I love the fact that the first statement speaks about our condition today. Where we can easily be ruffled, yeah. where we can easily be vexed, amen? Yeah. Not what you use and you pie pie on your chest, that's vex, okay? <laughs> vex, you Google it, okay? Like many times we're, we're, we're easily, we're easily ruffled when, when we hear bad news, but yet thank God that the message of the resurrected yeah. Christ yeah. is yeah. never be alarmed. Amen. Come on. That's right, that's right. Help. Never be alarmed. Do not be discouraged. Can you tell your neighbor that? Like, tell your neighbor, please smile. Do not be alarmed. Amen. Do not be discouraged. And, and it's good because there are certain things in life today. You're sitting here. You're here physically present. But your mind and your heart there may be somewhere else. It may be that call you. You got during the weekend that you need to see the doctor tomorrow. And I love the message is, it's do not be alarmed and do not be dismayed or do not be discouraged in any way. And the, the next message out of the four messages that I find here is that the angel said, you are looking for Jesus, Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. 
He has risen. Everybody shout. He has risen. He has risen. He has risen. That's the second message. It is important for us to learn today. And I'm just going to give you my points quickly. Because I always <laughs> run out of time. That the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the linchpin of Christianity. Just, just write it if you're taking notes. It's the linchpin of Christianity. There is a contrast and it's important that Christ dying on the cross. That's, that's the primary message of, of God sending His Son. It's vital. It's the most important thing. And we're going to see the relationship between Christ dying on the cross and Christ being raised from the grave. Because without, we all know, without Christ dying, there will be no opportunity for Him to be raised from the dead. Amen? We know that. But yet, you have to understand that if Christ did die, and what is the message of Christ dying on the cross? Because Pastor, you said that the death of Christ is vital. Then in comparison with the resurrection, what if Christ just died, but He never really rose from the dead? What does that make of Christianity? That's why I said the resurrection of Christ coming out of the grave is the linchpin of Christianity. The death of Jesus Christ is necessary. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's necessary. It's necessary. He has risen. The death of Christ is important because the death of Christ is the symbol of salvation. Without the shedding of the blood, yeah. there can be no forgiveness yeah. of sins. Amen. Amen. Amen? If there is no forgiveness of sin, then there is no salvation. Yeah. Come on now. Yeah. <laughs> but yet, the cross could have only uh, done as much as save us, but yet we can actually, if Christ didn't rise from the dead, which is central and in fact important, then... What we believe could be no better than any other religion right now. That's right. That's true. Then we can just cross our fingers. Like if we all die, then the, the Christian symbol other than the cross is a cross finger. <laughs> like yeah, I, I, I'm hoping that this is true and everything that Jesus Christ said is real. We ain't crossing our fingers yeah, so because right. salvation is assured. Yeah, amen, amen. There is assurance of salvation. I think that deserves a clap. There is an assurance of salvation when we come to Jesus Christ. But much less if Christ died. And you have to understand that in the Old Testament, they had this symbol, an animal that they had to sacrifice because in the place of the animal, they should, the, the wages of sin is death, they should die in the presence of a holy God but yet every time they enter they had a substitute which is an animal without blemish without any spot or pastor now it would be really tough right to find an animal animal without blemish or spot yeah it was how many of you have seen a sheep without any blemish or spot hello right a lot of them have little spots and stuff and so it wasn't even easy because the idea is that if a sheep has blemishes so the sheep has shortcomings the sheep has to be perfect and what they would do is that they would offer once a week everybody shout once a week, once a week. And they would lay their hands because by laying their hands on the animal that was going to take their place instead of them dying for the forgiveness the blood of the animal the animal had to be slaughtered so essential to every offering essential to the forgiveness is death yeah, that's right. essential to the Christian walk is daily dying yeah, every yeah. day pick up your cross yeah. if you're not gonna say amen I'm gonna go down right now <laughs> death is essential death is required that if Christ died for us we must die to self yeah. by giving up our lives amen. Amen? amen and it's a form of substitution we're, we're substituting our sins, giving it to God, so that He can give us His righteousness. Amen. And so the blood must wash us clean. But you have to understand, they did that every week, which meant that every time they came, and the animal took their place, the quote-unquote idea of a scapegoat, that they were transferring their sins, and the animal took all the blame and the shame, but that was only, the animal was only able to save them from their past sin, not for 
for their future sins. And so which means the following week, they have to do it all again. Right. Help me out. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Can you please tell your neighbor, we have to do it again. Yeah. Come on, tell your neighbor that. Yeah. It's a perpetual act of worship. Thank God we don't have to bring animal sacrifices right. anymore. Amen. Could you imagine walking this all? I don't know, goat, I don't know how lambs, lambs their meats of, I don't know how, how they do that. And so the death of Jesus Christ is so important. It's vital. Without him dying, there's no forgiveness. So therefore, Pastor, what's the message of the resurrection? And we're going to learn that in a couple, uh, in the next few moments. So the second message is his risen question. Christ rose from the grave because he wants to teach us an important principle in life. His people always ask me that, then why is it this, that Easter, we know that Christmas is important to us, but there's nothing more important than Easter for us because this is the day 2,000 years ago that everything that Jesus Christ said was true. The way, the truth and life it was a validation and you have to understand that when his best friend died, Lazarus, it was then when Jesus Christ called him out when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Yeah, amen. Isn't that an amazing verse? Like Christ was saying, this thing with my friend Lazarus is a precursor because when I die, I need to, to be raised again so that, watch me now, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so important so that you have hope yeah. that one day you will rise again and you will be with the Father. Amen? Amen. Come on now. We do not live just for this life. Amen. That's right. Hello? That's right. Think about it. We're not supposed to live just for this, this particular life. Christ rising from the dead gives us now hope, which is an eternal hope. That man, that there is eternal life after death. That death is not the end. And, and this is one of the things that I want for us to understand and learn. Because during the time of Christ, death was not something that they were so afraid of. Death was something that they celebrated. Amen. That's right. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Man, I'm looking for my amens. They went with pastor. <laughs> there are three things. I'm just going to cut through the chase. The third message is, He is not here. Everybody say, He is not here. He is not here. And in the Message Bible version, it even says there, He is no longer here. You can see for yourselves that the place is empty. I love that. Only in the Message Bible version, it says, like, look for yourself. The place is empty. He is not here. God is not in religion. He is not here. God is not in the good works. He is not here. And this is the thing, friends, that we have to understand. That's why the resurrection of Christ is so important. Because you do not need to do anything to earn His salvation and His forgiveness. That's what religion does. Religion gives you the opportunity to do penance, to do good, so that you kind of feel like I kind of deserve this. None of us deserve His salvation and His love and His forgiveness. Can I hear an amen? We ought to be like that. That tax collector beating his chest saying like, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. I'm a sinner. Instead of that haughty, self-righteous man, the, the tax collector was unrighteous, but the Pharisee was a self-righteous man. And he said, I tithe and I give and I pray. And God rejected his prayer and accepted the prayer of one who said, I am not worthy. Listen, that is what we, that is what we call the love of God. Such an amazing grace because it is something that's undeserved. He gave us when we didn't deserve it. A lot of our pursuits are empty. He's not there. Some young people go from relationship to, to the other and God is not there. It's empty. It's an empty pursuit. And I love what other translations, and I have a fourth message there. It's, Do not be alarmed. He's risen. He's not here. Just as he said. Can you please turn to your neighbor and say, just as he said. 
I love that fact that Jesus Christ has been saying and has been reminding them that I'm going to rise again. Just like he said. You have to understand that they never understood. You know what? Today we'll look back. Everybody say we'll look back. We'll look back. We'll look back and I, I know I'm, I meet a lot of people who are agnostics. They don't believe in God. And then I sit down with them. I kind of give them, you know, the veracity of why they need to believe the Bible. And probably some of you are sitting here and, and you're still going through that particular journey. Trying to kind of validate whether I need to believe in God or not. Somebody once said, you need to doubt your doubts and believe your beliefs. It's important for you to investigate. Can I hear an amen? amen? If eternity is such an important thing for you, then you need to investigate. Yeah. If you find no validation in this so-called Christianity and, and your so-called faith, I encourage you to just walk away and enjoy the meager, the measly 70, 80, 90 years of your existence here on earth. Might as well enjoy sin with, without any conviction. Just don't do both. Come on, help me out. If you believe, you better be all in. If not, then you know what? Fly, just jump off of the plane. Enjoy your life. You need to investigate. You need to find out, why do I believe in this Jesus? And if, if he's really everything he says he is, and I pray I can help you today. I'm praying that this message will help you today overcome a lot of your objections. But you have to understand that the pursuit of knowledge to, for us to, to understand the things of God. Because people always say, I need facts to believe, Pastor. I need facts. You have to understand that to research, to, to find out, to know is like one foot. Facts will lead you to the door. But faith requires for you to enter in. I'm going to repeat it because many of you didn't hear it, didn't get it. A lot of us require to know. I really need to know. And that's amazing and that's good. But there comes a point in your life because you have two feet. There comes a point in your life where you're standing in front of a door. And this time you have validated everything that you need to know about God. There's still some questions that are lingering. But the moment you stand in front of a door, the Bible says without faith. Yeah, it on. is impossible. Do you think I can walk on air right now? I don't have that faith. This is only an illustration. <laughs> when you, the door is open, Amen, yeah. you need to walk by faith. Yeah, yeah. You can't be a factual Christian looking for validation all the time. Because knowledge won't change you. Yeah. Listen to me. You can read your Bible all you want, but knowledge won't change you. Faith. Changes and transforms. And we will walk by facts, nah. We will walk by feelings, nah. We will walk by faith. Amen. Amen. The doctor said that there's something wrong with me, you know. I went to the doctor, the doctor told me that they found three things. What do you call that again, mom? No, no, that's, I don't call it ceased yet. <laughs> it's like, uh, what do you call that? Well, that is because something like that. <laughs> That's why I'm a pastor, and I don't know any of those medical things. And, and, the, 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 and the doctor told me, you know, we're kind of just watching if it goes from 6 cm because it is 6 cm. If it goes to 8 cm, they found three in, in the next six months. Then we need to take it out because yeah, usually if it's 8 cm, there's greater chances that it's it's cancer and all that. But you know, I walked out of the the doctor's office and I, I grabbed a burger. I was happy. I was fine. <laughs> I was like, okay. So be it, Lord. So be it. Be because we need, we cannot use feelings as our gauge to walk. Yeah. Like, it behooves me. I struggle with Christians that I counsel that every time or any time good things happen in their lives, they praise God like there's no tomorrow. Ha have you not met people who want to serve and go to Bible school because times are great and things are good. But the moment things take a turn, yeah. like a week later, yeah. a week ago they said, like, I want to serve the Lord, Lord. Lord, I offer my life. To... And they do this dance with flags. <laughs> Everything I've been through. That was a week ago. Then they lose the job. Husband cheats. 
and they no longer believe in God. Whoa! Brother, sister, you're walking by circumstances yeah. instead of walking by faith. A lot of them never understood everything that Christ said. He said, this is my struggle. We're reading the Bible and every event already happened. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Hello. Yeah. It already happened. We're reading history, guys. Yeah. Josephus was a Jewish historian and he did speak that there was one time a man by the name of Jesus Christ and he had like a group of followers willing to die to the very end in other words whether you believe that Jesus is really the Messiah or not but it did at one point in time there was a Jesus who walked on earth Tacitus was a, a Roman historian history is filled with validation that there was a Jesus but the question is do you believe everything that he claimed directly to be or indirectly to be when he said this was when he got in trouble he didn't he didn't call people to th that's the difference between jesus muhammad buddha confucius we know confucius is confused that's why he's called confucius i hope no one here worships confucius because you're kind of confused okay like every religious leader guess what none of them none except christ Nobody claims to be the Messiah. Nobody claims to be the man God. Everybody always claims to know the way. I'm pointing to who God is and where God is. What did Buddha say to his followers? I read it. The last chapters of his book, he said what? Find the truth. Seek the truth. And then Jesus Christ comes, claims not to point the way to God. He says, I am the truth. Hasta la vista, baby. That deserves a louder clap. Come on, you clap louder with the Canucks win. Come on. Well, why do we believe? Why is the resurrection of Jesus Christ so important? The word resurrection comes, the etymology, meaning the meaning of the word, comes from the Latin word which means rise again. I'm not gonna attempt to speak it because I'm not, I don't know Latin, but this it sounds like. Resorgeri. No, not to say Italian. <laughs> I tried many times. The old French word is the word resurgent, which means to come back to life. Understand that if Jesus Christ died 30 minutes later, he rose from the grave, that's not called resurrection. Hello? That's called resuscitation. Yes. Come on now. Yes. You're kind of like half dead, half alive. That's why this is very important. Resurrection happens when the person or the thing is dead. Amen? Amen? Revival happens when something is about to die. You revive a person that's dying. Can you hear an amen? amen. That's why the church needs revival. But let's be honest, the church is more dead than a, a, a fish. Than a, uh, what's a fish in the Filipino again? Tilapia. <laughs> in the Filipino store and it's the crazy thing when you go to a Filipino store they say it's fresh it's frozen and fresh how can something be fresh and frozen really it's like the church it's frozen and we're fresh <laughs> dying needs revival you revive something that's <laughs> no no I remember this story do you want a funny story <laughs> a funny story of this particular uh, grandfather was dying but he had this golden rule because he had this this convenience store that somebody has to be in the store all the time like whatever happens it's a family business so he was dying and he could not see anymore and all the kids were there and they, dad all the kids are here because the nurse said the doctor said it's it's on his last few breaths and so he couldn't see anymore so like oh is Dodong here uh yes pa i'm here is inda here uh, yes papa inda is here is, is Salvador the third, the port, the pit there? <laughs> Everyone is here, Lolo. How about our grandchildren? Abigail the 12th, 12, Abigail the 13th. <laughs> Lolo, everyone is here. Are you sure? Because I could not see anymore. Yes, Lolo, everyone is here. If everyone is here, then who's watching the store? <laughs> <laughs> he died. I don't know where the story is going, but it's a funny story. Let's, 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 let's,
that too. That's the only thing you remember out of this particular message. I have a feeling. Not to revival. Let's talk about revival. The resurrection is Christ died for three days. That it, it took God to bring Christ back to life. Regarding Jesus Christ, this is the part that I love and give me the next five minutes to do this. Uh, Nicky Gumbel in his book entitled Questions of Life, this is what he said. I'm going to read it verbatim uh, and I'm going to quote. He said, yet in the case of Jesus, he fulfilled over 300 prophecies. How many prophecies he fulfilled? Over 300 prophecies he fulfilled, spoken by different voices over 500 years. Including 29 major prophecies fulfilled in a single day, the day he died. The day Jesus Christ died, 29 major prophecies were fulfilled. That's amazing. 29 prophecies fulfilled when he died on that cross. Now this is the case for the Christ that I would like to share with you. Regarding Christ being born into this world and him dying. Don't you know prophecies as old as 760 years before the time of Christ? The book of Isaiah, the book of Micah, they prophesied regarding Jesus Christ. Now watch me now. They prophesied that he was going to be born in Bethlehem. That's found in Micah chapter 5 verse 2. That he was going to be born by a virgin. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. 760, 750 years before Christ. That he would be given the throne of David. 2 Samuel chapter 7. This throne will be an eternal throne. He will be called Emmanuel. So these are certain things that were prophesied regarding the Messiah. Now watch me now. I understand the possibility of a conspiracy. Like everyone goes like, if I'm the mother, if I'm the dad, not the mother. If I'm the dad, and I'll go to Mary and say, hey, you know what? Let's just pretend that our son, Raphael, will change him to Emmanuel. Okay. So that he'll become, he'll become the Messiah. Okay. So that could be something that can be conspired. Amen. And let's go to Bethlehem because the prophecy says, let's go to Bethlehem. Of course, you have to understand that even when the prophecies were spoken, the prophets wrote without understanding. Even those that read, they had no understanding. We only kind of piece the puzzle together because it already happened. And so anyways, let's just pretend. That's the problem with Christianity is everything is a one big conspiracy. And so here, and let's call it, and, and Mary, let's just pretend you're a virgin. And let's go to this particular town, call him Emmanuel. But you have to understand there are a lot of things in the life of Jesus Christ that history validates that required conspiracy with every stranger. Like he was visited by Magi. Yeah. Then at that time, the firstborn were killed because Herod wanted Christ knowing the prophecy. Even Herod knew the prophecy that the Messiah was going to come. It was going to be a threat to his political kingdom. And so he told him, like, whoever comes, like a one-year-old kid, whatever, firstborn, kill everyone. Hello. Amen. You can conspire that. It's like you're conspiring with your enemy to fulfill prophecy. But this is the staggering truth. Listen, please. Well and good. But when he died on the cross, a lot of things happened. That the people, the guards, the soldiers, like if they knew scriptures, they didn't know that they were fulfilling every prophecy that was given 700 years before the time of Christ. To be betrayed by his friend for 30 pieces of silver, Psalm 41. His price money to be used to buy a potter's field, Zechariah chapter 11. To be crucified between two thieves. Isaiah 53, to be given vinegar to drink, to suffer the piercing of hands and feet, Psalm 22. His garments to be parted and gambled for, the earliest sign of casino. <laughs> now think about it, come on. You're a thinking person, you're a smart person. Why would they let themselves become actors and players to this particular prophecy yeah. that the Messiah, yeah. That's right. if, if it were not true, that they were playing into the hands of this amazing conspiracy, a tapestry of a story that is unvalidated, nothing more than fiction. But they were part of it. His garments would be parted. No bone was to be broken, Psalm 34. Exodus chapter 12 and Numbers chapter 9 to be buried with the rich. Christ was so poor. He was so poor. Yeah. But 
but yet the prophecy was he was going to be buried with the rich. And Joseph and Nicodemus asked for his body. He, he was born in a borrowed tomb and he lived a borrowed life, nailed on a borrowed cross, buried in a borrowed tomb. The Christ. So everyone therefore conspired. Listen, if the death of Christ was such a conspiracy, not only were the disciples guilty, but the guards and everyone else, Jesus had no control over the actions of others and over these events. Amen? Amen. But you have to understand the greatest struggle that people have, agnostics, because I was at one point, that they stole the body of Jesus Christ. How many of you heard of that? Man, Jesus Christ really didn't die. And that's what Muslims believe. That he really didn't die. He didn't rose from the grave because he didn't die. Now you can actually be sitting there going like, oh, that's a possibility. Now look at me. I, I, I'll give it to you. It's a possibility that Jesus Christ really... Yeah, this is just... Like he died. Not, for him not to die, it's kind of like a stretch. For having been brutally uh, dehumanized to... To be subjected to torture because you all know that. That was what he went through. And scholars had to. Cicero spoke about crucifixion as the most barbaric form of, of, of capital punishment. The, it started in Persia and it spread all over. And Alexander the Great did that to instill fear among his enemies when they cap captured lands and cities and, and kingdoms. It was outlawed years later because it was just so dehumanizing it, it was so inhumane you would do that to cats or dogs and skin them alive it was basically what Christ had to go through but this is the thing about the conspiracy that they stole the body can you please just tell your neighbor they stole the body you know the apostles they really wanted to have this fabricated story make up this fabricated story stole the body of Jesus Christ hid it now please, look at me. When Christ was dying on the cross, who was at the foot of the cross? Women! Because women are braver than men. Amen. Let's close in prayer. <laughs> Some of the men. <laughs> you may be stronger, guys, because you have biceps and triceps. But come on, women are more courageous. Amen. They stood at the foot of the cross. There was only one apostle among the twelve. One killed himself, one denied him, but there was only one apostle, John the Beloved, stood at the foot. You know why he stood there? Because his wife told him to stand there. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's a joke. <laughs> You're so brave. No, my wife told me to stand. <laughs> they were hiding, weren't they? Yeah. They knew what they did to Jesus, didn't they? Beaten 39, 39 lashes. <laughs> some of you got that, some of you didn't. 39 XXX. Wow. <laughs> lashes. Some of you didn't get that, it's okay. <laughs> Beaten. Would they come up with this? Hey, wait, 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 wait. Can we please, can we please go back and, and, and kind of like study history? What happened to the apostles? All of them died violent deaths. Peter was exactly when he said, Lord, I'm not going to let anyone touch you. He died just like Christ. He was tied to a, a cross, turned upside down according to Bible scholars and burnt. Jesus' half-brother James thrown from the promenade. A couple of feet down he fell, brain splattered all over. John, the beloved, thrown in a boiling cauldron of oil. He was the Easter food. <laughs> he was the meal <laughs> but miraculously only John the beloved out of the apostles didn't die a violent death so that he could run to Patmos and write the book of Revelation the point here friends is this they were tortured yeah. and the one thing I know about myself because the, the character kind of shows the fact that they were afraid and they loved their lives and they ran away if you torture me and say Anton where did you hide the body? I'll say, Queensboro Bridge under. I, I won't let you even touch my toenail because I, I know you'll torture me to death. One of them could have just said, it's somewhere there. But 
History points to the fact that there was no body to be shown. Amen? Amen. That they died. You will never die for a lie. That's right. Come Amen. on. Come on. Amen. Some of the husbands, I do. I do. I have died for my life. You will never die for a lie. And so if it's so true, 2,000 years later since Christ died, somebody could have found fractions and bones of reportedly Christ, but none. So it takes greater faith to believe that they hid the body yeah, right. yeah. than to believe right. Right. that he rose from the grave. Yeah. Give the Lord a clap of praise. Yeah. Last point, man. Are you enjoying yourself there? Hello? Are you good? Yeah. I just want to read one last passage. Can we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Now, brothers, chapter 15, verse 1, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received on, on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly by the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. You have believed in vain. Everybody say you have believed in vain. Help me out. First Corinthians chapter 15, I love first, one of my favorite books or chapters is First Corinthians 15. Because it first speaks about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Watch me please. Because it says, either you believe that Christ rose from the dead. The reason he rose from the grave is that when you read next verses later it says, if Christ rose from the grave, that means we have hope that we will rise from the dead. That's right. That's right. In other words, what Christ did was to assure you, hey, I'm going to go first. You're going to go next. Yeah. Hello? Amen. That life should not be lived for all of its value of the 90 years. If you're lucky, you live till 95. I have a prayer to the Lord. I don't want to live until 100. Anyone? Sometimes you have a like great grandpa is still alive and he's 100 years old. He only opens his eyes so that he could eat, so that he could go back to sleep. I don't want to live a life like that. Amen? Hello? I don't know about you. I don't want to live till 100. I want that I'm If I'm kind of no longer functional at the age of like 90 or 85, I'm good to go. Help me out. Anyone? You, you want to live till 120? I don't want to live. I don't want to live forever. Are you kidding me? Because it only reminds me, man, that the life that I live, I, I love the next part. It says there that the gospel is this. You, you, you can read it when you go home because you're smart people. The gospel is this three things. That Christ died, he was buried, and he rose. Christ died, he, he was buried, and he rose. Help me out. Amen. Christ died, he was buried, Amen. and he rose. Say it again. Christ died, he was buried, and he rose. Isn't that the same as baptism? That we are buried under water symbolically so that we can rise as new people? Amen. Yeah. Help me out. Yeah. Isn't that the gospel? Preaching of, of the gospel. The gospel is preaching salvation, driving out demons, healing the sick, and baptism. Then why do we have baptism then? Because what it is saying is, watch me, this is a symbol of what's about to happen. Yeah. That this body one day I'm going to lay it to waste and I'm going to be buried underground and I'm going to rise again in the new and resurrected body. Which means that death is something that we should never frown upon. Watch me please, because I'm going to end, I promise, I'm going to end. Give me some music so that I'll end. I, I meet a lot of Christians that are afraid of death. As if you don't read in the Bible that death is inevitable. Everybody say death is inevitable. Yeah. Which means what is going to happen. Can you please turn to your neighbor and say it, 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 it will happen to you. Come on, scare them. I don't know, sooner or later. I don't, <laughs> I don't, know. I don't know if I have a hand in it or a part, but I, hopefully not. But don't you know that death is, is actually a mirror of birth? I love Ecclesiastes when it says there's a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to harvest. You cannot harvest if you don't plant. I love the fact that death and birth face each other every day. Watch me. When you 
were in the tummy of your moms. How many of you were in the tummy of your moms? Raise your hand, help me out. Isn't it true? That everyone's waiting for you to come to this world. Usually it would take how long? Nine months. Nine months. Some of you are overstaying, aliens. You'd rather stay longer. Could you imagine the mind of this infant, you know, growing? Loving the world that he's in. Everybody say, loving the world that he's in. And, and, and he's eating mommy's food. Whatever mommy eats, he eats. He doesn't even have to chew. There are nutrients. And he's beginning perhaps to just kind of like begin to explore like floating in water. But guess what? After nine months or within nine months, this child needs to be birthed into this world. Which means that if you are birthed into this world, you die into that world. I ask you twice, help me out. That's the reason why when a child is born, he is birthed into a new world, but he dies into that old world. A child can't stay there forever. No, no, no. Child needs to be birthed into this world. And guess what? You know, that's what they say. That a child actually is blind for the first week or two. I forgot. I, the first, I, I forgot what it was because I was told when, when we had our baby that the child cannot really see clearly yet the first week or two or a couple of days, right? Am I right? That's why I'm a pastor. I'm not a doctor. And then the child begins to what? learn how to like see color. How many of you think that if you stay in the womb of your mom, everything you see would be an orca, whatever, Nemo, hey, where am I? I'm lost. Just water, 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 and then you are birthed into this world and you go like, look at the color, look at your faces, beautiful people. And then you learn how to walk, you experience the love of a mother, you are nourished, you learn how to stand, you learn how to run, then you learn how you tie your own shoes, and then you learn how to what? Like many teenagers, fall in love with another. So you have to die in the old. Can I talk about the spirit world right now? Because many of you are like, Lord, I really love this life, Lord. Hey! It cannot be compared with. Amen, amen. Jumping into heaven. We don't have the flowers that are artificial, by the way. They don't have it. I'm not kidding. There'll be flowers everywhere. Streets are made of gold. That's why some of you, you have to fix your being covetous here. Because if you're Filipino, you get a sin seal. Tick, tick, tick. Take out the golden streets. I'm going to bring it down back to earth. It is worth like thousands of dollars. <laughs> it's a world that we've never experienced yet. It is a world that is beyond compare. Can you show the image of that linchpin, please, quickly? We're learning something today, church. Amen. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the linchpin of Christianity. This is an image of a linchpin. I actually have it there. But anyways, later on, you'll probably see it there. How many of you know what the linchpin is? Raise your hand if you know. Anyone here in the construction business? A linchpin is just this little metal that you use. That's a linchpin. We have in the old place in, in Burnaby, we, we, we rented a warehouse and turned it into a church. And then one time we had youth of close to 200 youth and we got in trouble with City Hall. City Hall came and kicked us out. <laughs> but it was a warehouse, it's like 20 feet high. So what we did, we, we bought a, a scaffold. How many of you know what a scaffold is? Raise your hand. So that you can reach the top when we put lights and, and clean it up. And, Whatever. So it would take literally like a lot of men to put one this one big metal next to the other, like make the four corners, and then put this little thing steps and, and like raise it up so that we can reach 20 feet high. 
And so we would put all the metals together, we would assemble them together, everybody say assemble them together. Assemble. But we would require something like this, it's, a, it's like, it's not a lynch pin, it's more like a, a uh, I forgot what it's called, but it's also a pin, similar to this. Which basically, when you put two bars together, you need to put that to secure, it's just a little thing, to put that to secure so that it, you won't fall. Yeah. Right. You follow? Yeah. It's like connecting two things together, and there's this little hole, and you need to put that through. Now, a linchpin is so small, it's inconsequential, it's not important. It's a little part of the big thing. But you have to understand that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is literally the linchpin that holds Christianity and your faith together. Amen. Because if Christ didn't rise from the dead, the Bible says, it's useless to come here every Sunday. You know what we are? If, if we come every Sunday, and then Christ really didn't rise from the dead, our coming together, I, I, I call it, it's like a, a quasi, it's like a quasi existential, spiritual thing. It's not real, it's kinda. It's not spiritual, it's kinda. I call it a glorified rotary club. No, no pun intended. It's like, it's just a spiritual Kiwanis or it's just a spiritual Jaycees. It's just like a community of people coming together, looking for a common cause and calling Jesus. If you didn't rise from the dead, we're just a club. Yeah, that's right. Hello. Amen. That's what religion is, isn't it? Yeah. Where good, wise people have their own set of rules. This is why the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so important. Amen. And I love the fact that the resurrection of Jesus Christ means there's hope for our tomorrow. Everybody say there's hope for our tomorrow. Hope for Don't you know that if you're sick in your body, it has nothing to do whether God loves you or not. It doesn't mean you're living in sin because you're sick and you have a debilitating disease. It only means that you are here on earth. Yeah. The Bible says the last enemy to be destroyed, he destroyed it. He destroyed sin by dying on the cross. He destroyed resurrection. The law of death, let me repeat. The law of sin, he paid for it. Death on the cross, salvation. And the law, I mean the law, what, what, what did he say? <laughs> the law of death, because he rose from the grave. So which means you and I, Christ already championed sin and death. But the Bible says, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. That means you and I, we have to die in this physical world before we can even stand in the world, birth into the world of promise. Give the Lord a big hand. Let's, let's stand.